I'm Ed Masria, and today we'll begin this series by exploring the climate imperative. In 2007, we conducted a global emergency teaching, introducing the building sector and climate change. At the teaching, I was sitting next to Dr. James Hansen from NASA. I leaned over to Jim and NASA, and I asked them, when will we see the effects of climate change? He whispered back, when we reach one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. In 2020, we reached one degree Celsius. In 2023 is officially now the hottest year ever recorded. And now climate change impacts are breaking out all over the planet. So how much emissions are we in the building sector and the built environment responsible for? Well, building operations is responsible for 27% of CO2 emissions, industry 43%, and transportation 23%. But if we add building materials and construction and site work and infrastructure to our sector, that's almost half of all fossil fuel CO2 emissions. In 2015, at COP21 in Paris, the world came together and agreed to work to keep global warming well under 2 degrees Celsius, preferably at 1.5 degrees C. So where are we now in meeting these targets? You can see the building sector, building operations, that we've been relatively flat since about 2012. To meet the 1.5 degrees C target, we would need to reduce our CO2 emissions by 50% or more by 2030. In 2021, at COP26 in Glasgow, we issued the 1.5 degrees C communique. Then we called for a 50% to 65% building sector CO2 reduction by 2030. And for a good probability of meeting the 1.5 degrees C target, we called for phasing out emissions by 2040. For just a 50-50 chance, which is not that great, we can stretch out reaching zero emissions no later than 2050. To date, 74 major international firms and 29 professional organizations have signed on to meet the targets of the communique. So we keep hearing about 1.5, keeping it well under 2 degrees C, not going to 2 degrees C. Why do we hear this difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees C? Because there are two de very different futures at those temperatures. That half a degree C, if we go from 1.5 to 2, we can expect, and these are projections, that 1.7 billion more people will be exposed to severe, severe heat waves every five years. 100 to 400 million more people will be at risk for hunger. 1 to 2 billion more people will be without adequate water. And 1 billion people will be forced to migrate. So how do we achieve a zero carbon built environment? Well, it's a two-step process. Step one is planning, design, and construction, and step two is adding renewable energy. Step one, planning, design, and construction will get us 70 to 80% of the way to zero carbon 
through no cost, low cost, and cost savings options. That's everything from transit oriented developments, walkable communities, carbon sequestering sites, local food production, all the way to building, reuse, renovation and design, building shape, orientation, color, passive heating, cooling, daylighting and ventilation systems, all the way to bio-based materials and carbon sequestering structures. We have all this information. We can easily get 70 to 80% of the way to zero carbon. And to get all the way to zero carbon, the other 20 to 30% will require us to employ renewables, everything from site-based renewables to utility scale, solar, wind, and geothermal, hydro and geothermal. And you can find many of the strategies that I've just mentioned, adaptation and mitigation strategies at 2030pallet.org. It'll give you suggestions and recommendations for regional issues, city and town planning, planning out districts, working on sustainable sites, and all the way to laying out buildings, building strategies, and sourcing and selecting materials for construction and infrastructure. The question we need to ask ourselves now is, can we meet the 1.5 degrees C emissions targets? This is Toronto, a photograph of Toronto in 1891. Keep your eye on the Flatiron Building on the left side of the photograph. I'm gonna fast forward now to 2010. We went from masonry buildings, small spans, very small rooms, all the way to these huge skyscrapers, all glass buildings and open interiors. How did we go from the Flatiron Building all the way to new modern buildings uh, and construction? Well, it started essentially in 1925 with what's considered the first modern building, the Bauhaus. You can see that structure moves inside the building in columns, beams, and slabs, and the exterior wall is now hung from the building, and it can be all glass, very light frame. So what was going on at that time? Well, we had the Model T truck, was introduced in 1925. There was radio vision. There was no TV uh, at that time. And we made the first transatlantic call in 1927. In 1928, the International Congress of Modern Architecture was founded. And it was the first meeting of the architecture community to do something about conditions in Europe at that time, which were really quite bad. The meeting was held in Switzerland and they laid out architecture and planning principles. So for planning principles, they call for function-based zones, getting the housing and out of the industrial areas. They call for high-rise housing blocks, parkland, solar exposure in these housing blocks, uh, so we have lots of sunlight, and then free and efficient circulation. Le Corbusier presented his five points toward a new architecture, toward this new modern architecture. Column wall separation, free design of the facade and plan, horizontal windows for expansive views, and roof gardens atop buildings. By 1932, this new modern architecture was called a style and went international. It was called the international style because essentially you could take the same building and put it anywhere in the world because we can condition the interior spaces with fossil fuels. By 1939, you had the Johnson 
wax building, big open floor plan. And by 1949, Philip Johnson designed and built his all glass, single glass house in a cold climate, New Canaan, Connecticut, because fossil fuels then were unlimited and cheap. And by 52, we had the Lever House, a huge size skyscraper with, with curtain walls and all glass. And then by 56, we had the first uh, new city built on modern principles, Brasilia. And how did we do all this? It took only 27 years from 1925 to 1952 to change the world. And we did it all with design tools like this. We would consider them primitive today. T-square and triangle. Uh, we have to dip a pen in an inkwell uh, in order to draw lines. And you couldn't dimension a curve, for example. Uh, we had French curves, but, when, but you couldn't dimension them. It wasn't until 1960 that we got the first ink pen or pitograph and the first laptop didn't come in until 1991. So we did all that. We changed the world in 27 years with these tools. Think of what we have now and what we can do now. So can we meet the 1.5 degrees C CO2 emissions targets? We have 17 to 27 years to do it. Of course we can. Thank you. Greetings, Notre Dame Architecture faculty. Thank you, Carl Elefante, for inviting me to introduce Design for Freedom, a provocation to create a more humane future by centering climate action, not only on embodied carbon, but more so around embodied suffering and our building materials. The built environment is the largest single contributor to climate change and is also the largest industrialized sector at the highest risk of modern slavery. While we are starting to inspect our building material supply chain for embodied carbon, we must also inspect our embodied suffering or the forced and child labor that harvests, mines, refines, processes, transports and manufacturers are building materials that arrive at the job site. I absolutely loved the construction process. It was on site every week with Sana, here's Sejima Nishizawa, absorbing the weight and vast quantities of materials that were specified, procured, manufactured, transported and built on the site, belying the river building, which does sit lightly on the land. Design for Freedom by Grace Farms emerged in late 2017 when our investment in architecture intersected with our commitment to justice. Our stake in the ground is to end modern day slavery. I was also on the AIA national jury while Carl was then president and quickly realized when evaluating global projects that the entire construction sector was getting a labor transparency pass. Grace Farms formally launched the new movement in 2020 to create a radical paradigm shift to remove forced and child labor from the building materials supply chain to clean up construction on a global scale. We have been working with 100 leaders within the full ecosystem of the built environment, including universities, to answer this question. Is your building ethically sourced, free of forced labor, as well as sustainably designed? The answer is that in practice, we do not know. Addressing on-site labor is only half the equation. Forced labor in the building materials supply chain must also be addressed. Construction is the largest industrialized sector at the highest risk of forced and child labor. Nearly one 160 million children are in forced labor conditions and nearly 28 million around the world are also in forced labor conditions, working in hazardous and inhumane environments, millions to extract and make our building materials. The next step in architecture justice must include social equity 
and material transparency. You are familiar with the trajectory between the beginnings of climate action centered on building materials and now we are asking that the next step in architecture justice must include social equity and ethical material transparency. Ethical decarbonization. This is a new term that requires traction. Our decarbonization strategies and sustainable building materials must also be humane, no longer subsidized with forced and illegal labor. Without inspection of the thousands of raw and composite materials, there is no accountability and the egregious social equity violation of forced labor proliferates. Minimizing the risk of embodied suffering can be achieved in parallel to the movement to minimize embodied carbon and is noted in this new report by the Yale Center for Ecosystems and Architecture and UNAP, which Design for Freedom is also noted. The, and also you'll see the regenerative material practices wherever possible should be shifted so we can uh, use ethically produced low carbon earth and bio-based building materials. Even large scale renewable projects like solar panels that include polysilicon, copper and aluminum have significant supply chain challenges in terms of processing, refining and manufacturing of clean energy technologies and exposure to forced labor. The grave cost of human exploitation is even more urgent to address in light of warming planet, extreme weather and climate change as the impacts of these crises are felt disproportionately by the most vulnerable. Climate change is forcing mass migration as crops, water sources, and farming opportunities continue to diminish. A migrant workforce is one of the top key risk factors for modern slavery. You can see here that the regenerative materials movement notes also embodied suffering with a new, within a new book by the ILFI. The regenerative material movement does truncate the supply chain where it's at the highest risk. And the new most recent Global Slavery Index for 2023 identifies solar panels as one of the top five at-risk materials. This is the first time to see that, although we've been known about the production of polysilicon, nearly half of the world's supply has been the Uyghur region of China. So environmental sustainability is simply incompatible with forced labor. Our Design for Free report, this report was issued in 2020 and the Design for Freedom toolkit in 2022 which notes relevant sustainable uh, certifications and standards that also include third party labor audits and affirms that material circularity does truncate the supply chain at the extraction level where there is the highest risk of forced and child labor. We also illuminated the 12 materials that are at the highest risk, both raw and composite. It was the first list that was available to the sector. And we also made sure that we are including the full ecosystem of the built environment, that the means and methods to ethically influence the building material supply chain are evident in these areas of blue. So we're including the full ecosystem. We all have agency to fuel the movement of design for freedom. And since the beginnings, we've had over 100 CEOs, principals, leading experts, that are participating on a firm level too, uh, quite often in the Design for Freedom Working Group. And university partners, we hope that Notre Dame will also now become uh, one of our partners. This is the beginning of doing so. And the difference between the green building movement and Design for Freedom is that global laws forbid the use of slave labor in the built environment, and yet our buildings and the materials that go into them are heavily reliant on slave labor. You'll find in our reports and online the countries that are moving to make corporations more accountable through trade regulations and other um, modern day slavery acts. They're continuing to es escalate and increase. There's also legally logged timber laws and regulations that you should be aware of. The key question 
the key business question within Design for Freedom is, are owners subsidizing their ROIs with slavery or accepting the slavery discount? The answer is we don't know because we've had very little inspection or accountability to our supply chain. But the statement that we make and we hope that you all adopt is we can no longer accept the slavery discount. This is a reverse, think about it, it's a reverse of thinking because quite often it's like, is, some, is this gonna cost us more? It's actually, are we accepting the slavery discount? This toolkit I think you'll find very helpful for your students, it's being widely used now. And we are starting to apply this and part of developing pilot projects um, has been contributing also not only to toolkits, but also to uh, firm-wide investigations and researchers, you know, research themselves. We are, have pilot projects on three continents. Shadow of a Face by Nina Cook John is the Harriet Tubman Monument. She's also been, is now the curator of our new Design Freedom exhibit at Grace Farms in the spring. Black Chapel, Serpentine Pavilion, New Canaan Library with the Turner Construction. Um, now firm wide adopting Design for Freedom principles is remarkable. And the bridge, a thousand, actually a million square foot project in New Delhi has also created a whole subgroup within Arab to use their wherewithal in engineering to also create transparency. It's remarkable. United States and State Department OBO is also uh, committed and has uh, has been informing and educating uh, teams. We're looking for for projects with them as well. So the Design for Freedom Summits, where we galvanize a number of industry leaders. We've had 500 in our last one, 60 of which were students representing 23 universities, and we'll be holding ours again on the 26th of this year. ACSA has a Design for Freedom student competition, and this will launch in the fall of 2024. So uh, thank you, Carl, for thinking about how we can start to uh, include uh, Notre Dame. This is it. This is a point in time that now you know you cannot unknow it, and there is a due to act. We are excited to see how you will use this knowledge, the beginnings, your team together, to help us fuel a movement where every building should be financed and built for freedom. We can and must investigate materials that we build with to create market transformation and end embedded suffering or dependence on forced labor in our buildings. This is a rare and promising time to initialize ethical decarbonization with your students to assess and lower both bodied carbon and embodied suffering in an opaque, weighty marketplace that will have significant humanitarian impact to design for freedom. Thank you and looking forward. Hello everyone, this is Carl Elefante, Senior Research Associate with the University of Notre Dame School of Architecture Michael Christopher Duda Center for Preservation, Resilience, and Sustainability. My comments today address the last of the three imperatives guiding the evolution of 21st century habitation, the urban imperative. All three of the 21st century imperatives introduced today were the subjects of three long-standing initiatives of the United Nations. Each was the subject of historic actions taken by the UN in 2015 and 2016. These UN activities were guided by a handful of fundamental understanding of today's world. The world is shrinking. Everyone and everything is connected. The size of global population and resource intensity of our modern ways of living are overburdening every category of natural and human resources. And the time horizon for resolving these challenges is short. Actions over the next three decades are crucial. The first of these three UN conferences, the Sustainable Development Summit, was conducted by the UN General Assembly in New York City in September 2015. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development 
was adopted, including these 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Since their adoption, the SDGs have provided a frame of reference for nearly every UN activity, including climate change and the urban agenda. Sharon Prince's earlier comments made it very clear that architects and architecture have essential contributions to make in assuring even the most basic human rights and social justice. In December 2015, the Paris Climate Summit was conducted. As Ed Mazaria summarized earlier, two profoundly significant targets were established in Paris limiting global warming to no more than 2.0 degrees Celsius based on long-range projections of the consequences of higher global temperatures and setting a time frame for curtailing net greenhouse gas pollution no later than 2050 based on projections for continued global warming. It is difficult to fully convey how significant these targets are they define a great deal about actions over the next 30 years. The last of the three UN conferences was the Habitat 3 Summit in October 2016, conducted in Quito, Ecuador. The Habitat conferences have been conducted at 20-year intervals. Habitat 1 was held in Vancouver in 1976, Habitat 2 in Istanbul in 1996. While the justice and climate imperatives present pressing crises, the urbanization of humanity is in fact defining this moment in history. Human beings have become an urban species. Whatever the problem, whatever the objective, built and urban form will play central roles. Pope Paul's words from 50 years ago remind us that we must strive to understand our actions, not by their intentions, but by their results. We, the shapers of human habitation, must embrace our responsibility to create conditions that foster inclusion, equity, and justice. Architects are passionate advocates for the power of design. Design matters. But far too often we fall short in considering the results of our work. The impact of building is not measured when construction is completed. It is measured by the impacts on the lives of people who occupy and experience them. Cities are, and have always been, the primary tool humanity has employed to gain advantage and advance its lot in life. The built environment is made to nurture the greatest engines of progress, exchange and cooperation. As humanity's urban era dawns, conditions in our cities present difficult challenges worldwide. Human beings today are divided into two nearly equal segments, those who live in modern era cities and those who live in places that are mostly pre-modern. Neither the modern era cities of the developed world nor the pre-modern cities of the developing world are problem free. Rather, each offers lessons of what works and also what does not work. We people raised in the modern era places of the developed world have a hard time believing that unmodern settlements in the developing world truly have valuable lessons to teach. Yet those pre-modern places have more in common with the Athens and Rome we so ardently admire than do New York, Paris, or Singapore of today. In the 9,000 year history of cities, today's modern era cities are in fact anomalies produced by an unsustainable glut of fossil fuel energy and unabated resource exploitation. How buildings and cities are designed, constructed, and inhabited has tremendous influence on our way of life. In his 2011 book, Urbanism in the Age of Climate Change, Peter Calthorpe compared four scenarios of urban growth, conventional suburban sprawl and urban development, and two green alternatives at both suburban and urban densities. Measuring land, water, and energy consumption, 
as well as the extent of required infrastructure, differences in resource efficiency across the four development scenarios were enormous. Yet Calthorpe's metrics do not capture the dramatic differences in public health, safety, and welfare that conditions in the built environment can and do make. The public health crisis of the 19th century provides a telling analog to our recent public health crises in 2020, the coronavirus pandemic. In the late 18th and early 19th centuries, Industrial jobs drew millions of workers from agricultural regions into cities. For example, New York grew from 30,000 inhabitants in 1800 to 1 million in 1860, adding another million by 1880. Conditions were chaotic and squalid beyond imagining. Nearly six in 10 deaths were caused by preventable infectious disease. Parenthetically, these were the conditions that motivated Richard Upjohn and a dozen other architects in New York City to create the association that became the American Institute of Architects. New York City launched a massive reconstruction initiative, constructing New York's still heralded drinking water system and the nation's first city scaled wastewater treatment system. Slaughterhouses were restricted to the meat packing district and sanitary food markets were constructed throughout the city. Street sweeping and trash collection were implemented as municipal services, and the city adopted its first building and life safety codes. By 1940, when penicillin, the medical treatment for infectious diseases, became available to the general public, deaths from infectious disease had already dropped from six in 10 to one in 10. New York's urgent public health crisis of the 19th century had been overcome by changing conditions in the built environment. But architects and others who shaped the built environment did not aspire only to eradicate unhealthy conditions. Instead, they envisioned cities worthy of this land of opportunity. Today, we call their work the City Beautiful Movement. By the dawn of the 20th century, New York and dozens of other American cities were transformed from disease and squalor to the most admired cities around the world. What do the lessons of 19th century New York and the lessons from 9,000 years of urban history teach us about the possibilities for humanity's urban future in the 21st century? And in these days of miracle and wonder, of supersonic speed, of splitting subatomic particles, how do we answer architect and educator Bruce Mao's question from the opening years of the new millennium? Now that we can do anything, what will we do? In the words of H.L. Mencken, for every complex problem, there is a solution that is clear, simple, and wrong. Today, many of the most favored solutions are in fact glass half full solutions limited by the same modern thinking that produce the problems they are intended to resolve. Cities have been built to accommodate 3,000 pound personal transportation pods, cars, for about a century, while electric vehicles will address automotive operational emissions, but not their embodied emissions. Addressing the underlying shortcomings of auto-dependent development is still being missed. Our responsibility today is to look back on those ideas and values, the technologies and resources that shape the modern world with open eyes, ears, minds, and hearts. Everything about them must be retooled to overcome their unintended and sometimes intended negative consequences. Adaptive buildings and cities offer tremendous possibilities. They have the capacity to make immediate, significant, and measurable contributions toward resolving the justice, climate, and of course, urban imperatives. For architects and others who shape the built environment, it is a historic moment. The shrinking world has in real terms 
made us one human family. However unintended, the impacts of our modern way of life demand a retooling of everything about how buildings and cities are designed, constructed, and operated, and our actions must be clear-headed, decisive, and rapid. In his inaugural address, President John F. Kennedy spoke of his generation's destiny to confront the threats of nuclear weapons. There are parallels to the challenges we face today. Kennedy asked our nation and the world to convert the arms race into the space race from actions that threatened our future to ones that advanced it. This generation is called to welcome, not to shrink from, the three 21st century imperatives, climate, justice, and urban. The possibilities are incalculable. As you know, um, we find ourselves in a very privileged situation in this university in that, um, first of all, in turning to the school, we have discovered that two-thirds of the carbonization problem in the world is due to actions that could be, that have been taken, that would be reversed, have been taken by us professionally, that could be best also reversed by us if we persuade the world around us, not only our our practicing colleagues, but also our clients and our, uh, the, pl the public uh, sponsors of all this work to act in a different way. So uh, the elephants in the room are misbehaving buildings and sprawl, uh, plainly said. So in the moment in which the university comes in through this strategic plan and calls for a, a, a Catholic institution, uh, an institution that is a research-based institution, and and institutions are global institutions, all of a sudden the weight is on us to try to find a way to respond to this challenge. What do we do that is different than what we've done before? And our response has been very swift um, by any standard, uh, preservation uh, uh, in, the, in the form of the Duda Center, um, uh, housing community regeneration, which has, uh, has had an amazing run uh, in the school over the last th three years, and uh, and then and then adaptive buildings and cities, which is a, a nascent a nascent project, um, and to be to be not only funded uh, in the future, but also a a potential um, a potential platform for collaboration within uh, Notre Dame, particularly with with um, Keo and and engineering. And so uh, I thought that. Uh, the, the, the beginning of, of the institution of having, um, or, or of, the, of the process of having, better said, um, uh, um, professors that come to the school as research professors, uh, that the presence uh, here uh, of uh, a number of people, but principally Carl, uh, would be an opportunity for us to begin to address the whole agenda of the potential center for adaptive uh, buildings and, and cities. And so that was one important discussion that two of us have had now for a semester that is now cultivate, cultivated and, and presented in the form of these um, of this uh, colloquia, which are meant to generate a direction, you know, a vector, an agenda, maybe more specifically about where we want to head as a school or university. And the other one is this weekend, the, the, the invitation to, to 20 uh, research faculty and or professionals from around the country that are participants in the project for a new urbanism going back 30 years to, to tell us what their experiences have been and fundamentally tell us what we know, how do we know it, and perhaps what we don't know and how we should uh, direct our research in that, in that uh, in, in, in that way, and perhaps to even collaborate with us on various subjects, because one of the things that I'm worried about as the dean of the school is that our appetite much bigger than our capacity to, to, to engage in the work that has to be engaged in. So we need to enlarge our schools, and we need to, a school, and we need to actually enlarge it in the area of, of a, a more 
a capacious and a deeper research faculty and also a faculty that is capable of collaborating with our and engaging the university. So I'm very happy that you're here. This is going to be a series of presentations that are presided by Carl, directed in the, in the, conducted in the conductor model of music. We're going to have input from the outside in the form of presentations, followed by discussions, and then ongoing inquiry, one ongoing back and forth observations and or insights that are perhaps recorded and eventually presented as a bigger, as a bigger set of items that we need to first debate and second, perhaps follow as the constitutional pieces of a, of a much, much bigger agenda for, for work going forward. So there's nothing easy about any of this. I think the stakes are enormous. The stakes are at least in terms of architecture, as we now understand it, architecture, urbanism, and environmental design, including landscape, they are absolutely, utterly radical. And, and they're, they, they, they're poised to thoroughly transform the nature of our profession going forward and to make it relevant. Once again, I want to repeat for, for the ones you have me hear this, that when Ming Wu came uh, as uh, associate dean and, <clears throat> and uh, responsible for, for research and in the school, uh, when she came this July, she showed me a, the famous two ring diagram about how research is organized in the world and in the outer and how it's financed. And on the outer ring are all the key disciplines, there are about six or seven. And on the inner ring, or it's the other way around, the inner, which is a small ring, where a small number of disciplines, the key ones. And on the outside, where all the, the sub parts of each discipline, you know, biology having this, 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 kind of biology, science, science having uh, this, and, and, and arts having that and the other. And architecture was nowhere to be seen. There were at least, and there were at least 80 words on these two circles, and architecture was nowhere. <laughs> which is completely astounding, really. So you might say that part of this kind of exercise that we're engaged in uh, today for the five remaining um, uh, uh, colloquia here and for the meeting uh, this Saturday is the beginning of putting architecture on the map. I think it might be uh, some way of thinking about why, why we're all here today. Thank you, and let's begin. Interruptions are allowed, by the way. This is a discussion, not a monologue. Uh, yeah, that, that, uh, thank you for saying that. That is, uh, let, let's think of it in those terms. Um, so uh, I, I, I just want to do one more little bit of logistical introduction here, which is to say that uh, there, for each one of these sessions, we have uh, pre-recorded presentations made by outside experts. Because we're trying to spend as much of the time together in the room in conversation, those are going to be posted as kind of uh, further reading, if you will. Uh, so for this session, we actually have three, uh, one by Ed Masaria on the climate imperative, one by Sharon Prince on the justice imperative, and then I, I did one on the, on the urban imperative, which is probably the one that you already know uh, at, at any rate. So that, that's... Uh, um, you know, part part of what we're up to here. Um, uh, so uh, today, because this is a little bit of, uh, I'll call it a front-loaded program, because it's the introduction, we'll probably spend a little more time with me presenting and, and kind of laying the groundwork, uh, but hopefully at least we're going to spend 40 minutes <coughs> Uh, talking to each other. We're talking about these as round tables. Uh, the table's not round, but you are kind of facing each other. We really want to get to that discussion part of it. Uh, and, and when we do, I'll, I'll have a couple of more uh, logistic thoughts about how, how that will flow. But with that, I'm going to go ahead and launch into a uh, preliminary conversation about why these programs were put together and, and really uh, kind of lay the groundwork for the subject matter. And as you can see, we're going to launch this by really framing uh, 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 our conversation through these five sessions around the interlocking imperatives of the climate imperative, the justice imperative, and the urban imperative. And what we will 
now spend the next few minutes talking about what does that all mean. I just want to also do a little bit of background about myself. Uh, as a practicing architect, I spent my most of my career really uh, trying to bring together sustainable design, kind of green building ideas, and building stewardship, historic preservation ideas. And I can tell you that when I tried to intersect those two things, I found that I would go to a green building conference and people would wonder why I was talking about existing buildings. I would go to a historic preservation conference and they would wonder why I was talking about lead or sustainability. The world has moved on from there. And uh, I, I think that all of us uh, have a sense about the sort of interconnectedness of these subjects. And I think that that's extremely important for sort of where we are today, that we recognize that. What I would say about these three imperatives, and again, we'll get into a little more detail, is that climate change is the driver today. That if you wanted to just talk about where is the money flowing or where is policy change flowing and things like that, uh, it, climate change is the conversation framer for so much of how the world is, is changing today. Uh, that being said, if what we get out of climate change is only about carbon dioxide molecules, frankly, we will have failed because we're, we're going to uh, basically change everything about how not just buildings, but industry and agriculture and transportation, how those things are designed and constructed and operated. We're going to tweak everything in the name of climate change over the next very short period, like 30 years. And the needs of the world are not just limited to carbon pollution. Uh, and really, hopefully, through this huge e effort to uh, solve the climate crisis, we'll have the opportunity to actually address those larger issues. And last but not least, for us, we are at a moment of relevance revolution for architecture and urban design that the world is reaching a point where urbanization is the mode of civilization almost, and will become universal during this century. <clears throat> Therefore, whatever the problem is, we're going to do something about it in the name of climate change. And, and the solution will take its shape in built and urban form. So we're really at this amazingly important place in time for what we do. Uh, these ideas of the interlocking crises is by no means a new thought. If you go back to the very notion of the creation of this term sustainable development that came out of the Brundtland Commission uh, in 1987, uh, Grow Harlem Brundtland was asked by Javier de Cuellar to really look into this conflict between economic development and environmental degradation. And she said, I can't talk about just those two things. We have to talk about social well-being as well. Those three things are connected. Those interlocking uh, realms uh, totally influence each other. Uh, when we talk about uh, the kind of social need side of it, I think that you, each of you could add a word or two or three in terms of really defining what are the crises that we are faced with? Where are the challenges that we're faced with in our emerging 21st century version of the modern world? And I just want to uh, give us a little bit of background here that there is a very, very large conversation going on worldwide that really uh, directly comes back to us in shaping the built environment. And those three conversations, those three imperatives, were also the subject of three global conversations through the United Nations that took place in 2015 and 2016. And, you know, for us, you know, we're, we, we just want to design buildings. What do we care what's going on in the United Nations? The fact of the matter is, is that the, these very, very large global conversations really do define this, this new era of relevance for what we do. So it's really worthwhile to spend a little bit of time to understand this framework and how it influences what we do. So let's do that for a few minutes here. We'll start with the climate imperative. 
And as I said, the sense of urgency that it exists today in the United Nations level, within federal government level, even within the conversations among mayors and city council members, there's a real sense of urgency that we've got to act quickly and decisively about the climate crisis. And what's the framework of that? In a way, it's incredibly simple. It was established at the Paris summit in December 2015. These two goals of no more global warming than 2.0 degrees Celsius, those of you who know the subject, you've probably heard 1.5 degrees Celsius talked about a lot. There's a sense that actually the actual commitment in Paris was two, not 1.5. The aspirational goal was 1.5. There's already a sense that we're not going to be able to limit it to 1.5. We're already at 1.2. We're just not changing quickly enough. And I'll just leave it at that. And then the goal of 2050, when the goal was established, that was 35 years away. It's not 35 years away anymore. The time is marching on very quickly. And I wish I could say that we felt that the changes were marching on as quickly as they need to be. It really defines everything about this urgent climate initiative. The dean mentioned the role that the built environment plays. And I would just say two things to underscore that. One is that buildings themselves are the major carbon polluter, even more than cars, even more than industry. And I'll get into a little more detail of what I mean by that. And then also, as we well know, with things like transit-oriented development, what we do with built form and urban form determines a huge amount of what happens with agriculture and industry and transportation and so on. So we're just right in the middle of every one of these issues. We have to get comfortable with some new language and some new terms. Most of what is talked about in the climate crisis is energy sector related terminology. For example, scope one, scope two, scope three. We can glaze over very quickly. But actually, when you get into the details of what does this mean about building operation and building design, it's really not rocket science. It's pretty straightforward. Buildings contribute emissions directly by the consumption of fossil fuels in the building from the gas stove that you have to the gas boilers, et cetera. Buildings use power generated through dirty sources, through largely coal and other fossil fuel sources. So that's our indirect emissions. And then last but not least are what are called embodied emissions. And that's the industry and the construction processes themselves that create our buildings and maintain and adapt our buildings, all of which have their own profile of carbon pollution that are behind them. So direct, indirect, and embodied, those are not two very, those three terms are not all that hard to get your arms around. One of the pre-recorded presentations is by Ed Mazzaria, AIA 2021 gold medal winner. And really the person who came to AIA in 2002 and said, we need to be talking about climate change, not just sustainability, not just resilience. We need to be addressing climate change and created the Architecture 2030 challenge of how we get buildings to zero carbon. Again, the road to this is not that complicated. Listen to Ed's recording and he'll give you a very brief, it's only about 10 minutes long, overview of what does decarbonization in the building sector look like? What does it touch? And I just want to add my perspective as a building reuser that a lot of the things that we accept today as these are the green solutions, this is the way to get to zero carbon buildings. I really question just how deep the understanding is. And one of the reasons why I say that here is because our school is an outlier. Our school is taking a different approach 
to understanding architecture than essentially almost any other institution in the country. And we all know that. And it's extremely relevant here. The modern era is an anomaly. What has happened over the last hundred years is a little tiny blip in the history of 9,000 years of building cities and buildings. And what characterizes it? It's completely addicted to energy, mostly fossil fuels, and it is incredibly resource intensive. Our knowledge of traditional design, of traditional practice, we have an understanding of that perspective about the anomalous aspects of modern era design. The things that are being presented as climate solutions today, let's challenge them. And I'll just say one more thing about it. To me, it's buildings like this are the greenest buildings in the world. This building is, quote, passively designed. It's daylit and passively ventilated using, you know, air stratification, induced ventilation, et cetera. These are not passive systems. These are actively intelligent systems that use a thing called nature and physics to solve problems. So again, we have a really important role to play in this. Again, if we solve the problem and all we get out of it is carbon dioxide molecule changes, I think climate action will have failed. There's no difference between climate action and climate justice. Just like Grow Harlem Brundtland said in 1987, today, when we talk about decarbonization, we have to understand that it is in the context of a world that has other problems that need to be addressed. What are they? Well, I talked about the Paris Summit in 2015. Three months before the Paris Summit was a meeting of the General Assembly at the UN headquarters in New York, the 2015 Sustainability Summit, at which the 2030 Sustainability Agenda was adopted by not just a committee of the United Nations, but the General Assembly of the United Nations, more than 200 nations. And the significance of getting 200 nations to agree to an agenda like this should not be overlooked. The Sustainable Development Goals, which are represented by these little icons, really think of it as this is the program that the world community of nations has given to our profession to design to. Here's our program. Here's our design brief. Let's work on it. Look at the first five Sustainable Development Goals, poverty, hunger, health, education, and gender equity. These are big, big picture human rights questions, human dignity and human equity questions. This is what we're being asked to solve. It's completely in line with what we experienced with the Brundtland Commission in 1987. So another thing that's, I think, important for us to recognize, and again, our perspective on this is unique, is that, again, climate change is not the only thing happening. And in fact, it's not even the only environmental issue. It's not the only unintended consequence of modern era development that we need to address. For 60 years since Rachel Carson wrote this amazing book, we have considered carbon pollution and environmental degradation as the cost of doing business. We're simply at a point where we can't afford to do that for another 60 years. And in fact, you know, climate scientists are telling us in another 30 years, we'll reach a tipping point where the consequences of climate change will be out of control and that we really won't be able to do much about it anymore. So this this is, you know, really, this is the thing that's defining our urgent agenda, but it's not just about carbon. And another thing that's an important part to understand here is I just talked about unintended consequences. We understand that we can't measure our progress by our intentions. We have to measure our progress by our results, by the outcome. Are we actually getting there or not? Where we are right now with the climate crisis is a lot of people making commitments. 
very few people keeping those commitments. And we need to get beyond that. And to get beyond that, we have to deal with the whole truth, the actual con you know, conditions on the ground, the realities that we're dealing with. Many of these realities are not unintended consequences. Many of them are intended consequences. The conditions in our cities today are the results of intentionally adopted policies uh, that have resulted in things like bladed communities and uh, racial and ethnic in, uh, inequities and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, you might argue that the bankers that, that did the redlining weren't really motivated by race. They were motivated by protecting their, their portfolios of loans. But in the end, the policies they actually adopted were about differentiating race in cities. So we have to really be willing to face the whole truth. Um, for those who are into these topics on a global scale, the place where, where they consider that we're really beginning to see the cracks in the dam, where the fracture is taking place, is about food supply and food security. And in fact, from a, few, a food security perspective, Arguably, the two great migration crises that we've experienced in the last decade, the Syrian migration crisis and the Central American migration crisis, were both caused by climate change caused droughts. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we're literally beginning to experience the, 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 the social and economic uh, and political ramifications of the fracture beginning to happen as a result of climate change. I want to say one more thing about this, and this is the second recorded presentation that I really hope that you will spend the, t the time, again, it's about 10 minutes long, uh, by uh, Sharon Prince, pictured here. Sharon is this founder and CEO of Grace Farms. And then I just want to end this on a little bit of a hopeful note to say that, you know, architects are really saying, okay, the, 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 the sustainable development goals, the, that's our charge. Uh, what would it be like if we de designed affordable housing, if we designed assisted housing that literally created an economic engine to, to raise people out of poverty? And I would reference, uh, you know, Aravena's um, what, what he calls incremental housing is just an example of some really creative thinking. Um, and then last but not least, the urban imperative. And, and, you know, we in this room, we know a lot about it. I'll just add a couple of thoughts to it. As the third millennium really launches here, we're talking about the urgency of climate change. We're talking about these big social missions of, of the sustainable development goals. But I would actually argue the most profound change that's happening is the urbanization of the human species. And so the third summit that took place in this year, this was actually in 2016, not a year after the Paris uh, Agreement, um, was signed. Habitat 3 was conducted in Quito, Ecuador, and the new urban agenda was adopted. And the new urban agenda is basically taking the sustainable development goals and saying this is what this means in terms of what needs to happen in our cities with transportation and affordability, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, look at this basic statistic that the new urban agenda is based on. When this century began in 2000, for the first time in human history, more than half of global population lived in cities. The UN projects that by the end of the century, more than nine in 10 people will live in cities. So literally the 21st century will be known more about the urban century than even the climate change century. And the, our world today is almost equally divided by these two conditions. The developed world, the modern world that we're used to, that we live in every day, uh, and then in the UN terminology, the developing world. Uh, you could call it the undeveloped world, the, de the world that maybe doesn't want to be developed into the modern uh, you know, terminology that we've used. There, there's, but again, the, you know, these two worlds, I just will, will again go back and reinforce that the one on the left is the anomaly. The one on the left has only existed for 100 years. 
versions of the one on the right has existed for 9,000 years. So we, there's actually much more familiarity uh, with urbanization and human settlement in the unmodern world than there is in the modern world. The modern world is really quite a big, big change. Uh, and a lot of the things that we're dealing with now are really, again, these unintended consequences of our modern way of life. Another underscore on this is that a lot of the things like the building I showed before is the greenest building. A lot of the things that are understood to be the really important solutions that we just absolutely have to get right on are really glass half full solutions. And obviously here there's reference to the electric car. The electric car does address, using the energy terminology, the direct emissions from cars. What's coming out of the tailpipe of cars? It does not address either the indirect or the embodied emissions that are associated with cars, nor does it address how our communities are being put together and whether they require cars to operate or whether they don't require cars to operate. So we have to be uh, truly get, get the blinders off, really understand uh, the nature of the problems and the nature of the solutions. Um, in the building sector, this is just as real as the electric cars issue. These are images from two of the smartest cities in the world, New York City and Paris, France. And these, these, are, these, are, these are cities that other cities around the world turn to and say, you guys are doing climate change stuff. Tell us what you're doing. This is really exciting. New York's solution is that 50 story skyscrapers are not enough. We need 100 story glass boxes. And I'm not exaggerating. It's absolutely the, the, the truth. And I'll come back to that in a minute. In Paris, this is the Paris 2050 image. At least I can say that Vincent Cayabo has at least said maybe buildings will not just be glass boxes, but the, this is it. The, these are the visions of sugar plums that are being uh, uh, dreamed about as climate solution in, in buildings and cities. And it's not hypothetical. It's not theoretical. It's happening. What you see on the left here is the largest building ever intentionally demolished in the history of humankind. 270 Park Avenue, built as the Union Carbide headquarters by a woman architect uh, from 60 years ago, Natalie Dubois. Um, the, the, the only larger building that's ever been demolished, the World Trade Center, demolished by terrorism. Uh, what, are we, what are we associating with? At any rate, this is a result of uh, the adoption of the, the Midtown, the East, upzoning as a, a smart growth upzoning to make it so that the buildings around the Grand Central Station can go from being 50 story buildings to 100 story buildings. 270 Park Avenue is demolished. Uh, the the uh, JP Morgan Chase building is under construction now. It is advertised as a carbon, zero carbon building. Uh, you've got a plant a lot of trees to get that thing to be a zero carbon building. Uh, it, no way. Anyhow, so we are here and we're launching this initiative for adaptive buildings and cities. And there is tremendous potential of what we can do with the built environment. Uh, there are just there are possibilities everywhere. Uh, every aspect of how we design and build and operate our buildings has an opportunity to really uh, contribute tremendously to all three of these imperatives. We, as the keepers of the secret flame of traditional knowledge, traditional design, traditional construction, we have a perspective to add to this conversation that no one else is adding. No one else is adding to this. This is our charge. This is our mission to, to really take this on. Every generation is, is struggling with what they consider to be existential challenges. We, are, we have our own version of it today. I've just tried to describe it in launching this program. You know, when Kennedy took office, he asked the world 
to move from the arms race to the space race, to move from something that was threatening civilization to something that could advance civilization. That's exactly the situation that we're in today. We're facing this triple imperative. It is our opportunity to create the 21st century world that we really need. And as Kennedy says, I don't shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I hope that you do as well. I trust that you all do as well. So that's my introduction to these programs. And I want to just leave this up on the screen. I'd now like to really open this up and have this become a conversation. And I'm going to get away from the podium here and start this by simply giving you a minute to just look at these questions. And so what I just got done talking about for the last 30 minutes, sound familiar? Does this resonate with you in any way? Is this tying into thoughts that you've already had, things that you feel like you're already working on in what you're doing with your practice, what you're doing with your teaching, what you're doing with your research? Sound familiar? Well, somebody's got to have something to say. Well, what's new to me, Carl, is the fact that the building industries are connected to 12 areas in which human slavery is involved. That's absolutely new to me. And I'm glad to have you bring that forward. I wonder if one of those is sand, the mining of sand. Okay. Glass production. Just like glass production. Yeah. And, you know, in a way, I'm going to constantly go back to our interest in the relevance of traditional knowledge and traditional design and traditional construction. In a lot of ways, the thing that facilitates that modern slavery world that we that that does exist today is the global supply chain conundrum. And buildings used to be built from regional materials, regional supply chains. It was what, what was around your city. That, that was it. You know, maybe if you were the emperor of Rome, you could bring granite from <laughs> Egypt. But there weren't a lot of people that, that could do that. Um, so that just that, breaking the regional connection between our building design and construction and our regional resources has created an opportunity uh, for th that problem to exist today. Lucian? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Carl. As always, your lectures are so really inspiring. And I think we are probably familiar with much of what you said. I agree with Chris and I. I wasn't aware of that, so I kind of... There were enough there are enough signs of it. I mean, you can see that. Uh, I, I mean, I have heard that, uh, you know, like when they built the football stadium in Qatar, even, you know, with star architects, and the architects typically don't yeah. give too much, have no interest even for accidents, the working conditions, so the unsafety, and just the lack of care for the people involved. Um, I would just say, so that I think that uh, most of us are very sensitive to that, but then, then when I look at how we kind of teach our students, and I some something comes up to me which is always a difficult, a difficult challenge is when we kind of talk about the building techniques and the material, and and I know that uh, we are in a little bit uh, we are a little bit in a kind of challenge here because the student we have to kind of educate the students so that when they go out in practice they can be you know part of productive teams so we know that part of part of it, even what we teach them is not you know like for example the cavity wall and you know using a number of materials we know which are toxic materials which we shouldn't really use but uh, i mean I, I remember an argument i had with Years ago, when I was told, yeah, but that's the way it's done, and that's what the students have to know. And I think this is something I, I would really like to have some type of better options. For example, when we do world sections, 
I wish we could each time do at least an alternative one. Maybe we have one, which is the way it is done, as the student should know about it, but also the way it should be done. You know, that's because in some way, here in a context of academy, we should not only train people to be useful in practice, but we should train them to do the things the way they ought to be done to make a better world. And I think that's the also in the philosophy of the school. So I'm, I'm here to now, I think we have this wonderful opportunity in the fourth year to teach to non-Western architecture in the non-developing countries, which gives us this opportunity to go back to the true intelligence of natural building and the systems where you say the truly active natural system with natural ventilation, uh, with um, walls which kind of store heat and which have a good permeability and which kind of age wonderfully. So I think that's why where I kind of do load bearing and I just don't really care anymore for the cavity and everything, so I just kind of go full steam on natural system. But it would be nice if we could that we could do this all the time. Uh, it, it's a really, really important point. And uh, I, I would just just be a little bit uh, reassuring to say there are other people out there that are interested in this and working on it. Um, and I, in a lot of ways, the materiality part of it um, is is one part of a bigger story, and that is uh, the the human comfort side of it. I mean, literally, how did buildings a hundred or a thousand years ago uh, mitigate between the environment and human comfort? And we had a great presentation in our Master of Science Historic Preservation class last year of one of the students studying the, the um, uh, wind towers of Yad's Iran. Uh, and, you know, this just, uh, the, again, a, a quote, passive design system, an actively intelligent design system uh, to, to, you know, mitigate the most extreme hot climate that you ever could. Um, uh, Susan Roth, who is a, a professor emeritus in, in uh, England, has studied them. You know, if you research this, you'll find her work. The thing that she came away saying the most important thing about this is not the wind catcher, it is how this works to human adaptive comfort. And that, uh, you know, if it's 65 degrees and it's January, you wear shorts. If it's 65 degrees and it's July, you wear a sweater. Why? Because humans adapt to their environment. That, that, that's, you know. So we have a world now where you're supposed to be in a 70 degree space at 50% humidity, 365 days a year. There are people that are saying, that is not human health. That is mechanical health. That keeps all the machines happy, but it's not necessarily good for human health. And then if you, then if you look at the relationship of the built heritage and how that starts to align with adaptive human comfort and things like that. So at any rate, it's a very rich topic uh, that there's, there's a lot of potential uh, things to be working on there. And I, and I would just also just add that you, you also put your finger on exactly our dilemma. Uh, go ahead, go build you know, three foot thick masonry bearing wall building that uses thermal mass today. Find a client that will pay for it. We, 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 we have to understand what, what look, you know, in, in the, there's a book title, if the past teaches, what does the future learn? That's our dilemma right now. What can we learn from the past? But it's going to be about future solutions. It's not just going to be about past solutions. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. I mean, it's just wonderful to have opportunities like this to discuss these sorts of things. <clears throat> One thing that I find astounding, you show an image of, um, of, a, of a skyscraper that claims to be um, zero carbon. And, and what, what's remarkable is, is that there is no reaction to that. I mean, it's clearly false. It's a false statement. If you consider embodied energy, you know, any one of those buildings is, is, is off the charts when it comes to, when you compare it with uh, 
in the kinds of buildings that Lucien was describing. So where is the response? Why is there no, people simply accept the numbers and they're so clearly false? That's a question that I want to throw out. That's actually something we could contribute to. Right. I'm not really sure what it's in. I'm also... A bit louder. Okay. I'm also very curious about what arguments they're using to substantiate the claim that the building is zero carbon emission. I'd be happy to talk about that. Let's not get into too much of it today. We could spend the next hour trying to go through the kind of, the types of, I'm trying to reuse the right, I'm trying to come up with the right term here. The glass half full answers to those sorts of things. But there's offsets are definitely involved that, oh, we recycled all that building that we tore down, that sort of thing's involved. We're using recyclable materials. Like steel is recyclable. You know, yeah, sure it is. You know, but the carbon footprint from just recycling steel. Oh, well, we're going to reinvent the steel industry and it's going to be a zero carbon industry. So it's going to be great. So there's things like that. It's like multi-layered. I just want you to know I was on a call a couple of weeks ago and the architect for that building was on the call, very defensive about how much that building has been criticized. And I was really happy to see him squirming in his chair. So I was very interested in something that, you know, and again, voice up because we're trying to get heard around the world here, or at least in Rome. No, I had a question when it came to the, you know, the justice imperative, because I think there's, there's an issue when that's almost implicit in what you said, or actually very explicit when you compare the developed nations to developing nations. And one of the things that keeps coming back to my mind is because I was born and raised in a developing nation. We follow the examples, like you said, to the T. So we kind of forget where our, you know, the value was in the traditions that we had, because everything is trying to emulate what happens in the United States. And so I guess the question is because there's kind of a lag in learning between what's going on here and there. Right now, if you go back to El Salvador, basically we are to the point where we have more cars than people right now, because it's no longer a comfort item, it's a necessity. And just like we're doing that, there's also the notion that, oh, building is cheaper doing it like they do in the United States. And they sell it as, you know, development and giving job opportunities and, you know, trying to, it's a very aspirational market, I guess is where I'm going. So how have they considered or is there anybody taking into consideration that social aspect that may be what the, you know, our developed countries are teaching the developing countries is going to create a bigger problem because yes, you might have fixed something in the developed country, but then the developing country was probably 20 years later is probably still having, you know, carbon emissions or not using the resources as smartly as, you know, you were doing in the developed world. Like, is anybody tackling that aspect in terms of education or making people aware that what the model that you are following is not good or is not positive to the future? So we're at a very interesting page turning happening right now. So if you were, you know, just kind of paying attention to what was in the news about COP28 and COP27, over the last couple of years, there's begun to be this conversation framed about the global north and the global south. And that's, you take that slide and you take out developed and developing and you can put global north, global south in there. And what that basically is referencing is this kind of divide in the world. And it's really interesting in terms of human population, it's almost exactly right down the middle of half the world, 4 billion people living in the modern world and 4 billion people not living in the modern world. So part of that conversation 
at, at the kind of UN climate summit is literally about you guys in the global North, you were creating climate change. You were creating the carbon pollution. We are having to, in the global South, live with the, with the ramifications of that. You know, we're not the ones belching out, you know, carbon at a level, you know, and I'll just give you one example of that. 30 years ago, Bill McDonough said, our solution is we all have to just simply become Chinese because China's per capita carbon footprint was one tenth of what, Amer what an American carbon footprint was, okay, 30 years ago. That's not the case anymore. China is now right up there. China is the number one car carbon polluter in the world. <clears throat> and that has happened in 30 years that it, that, that, that it flipped over. So this moment that we're at now in this global north, global south conversation actually has a lot of dimensions to it. And what you're talking about is one of them. Um, I mentioned Susan Roth. Susan Roth will say, the worst buildings that have ever been built are lead platinum buildings. <laughs> no no, no if, ands, or buts about it. She's absolutely black and white about it for a lot of different reasons. But one is just you know, the global supply chain and modern slavery. It's people living in buildings that are sealed and they're supposed to be 70 degrees and 50% humidity. They're supposed to be you know, done with rain screens that seal the buildings, et cetera. What, what, what's really interesting about it, though, as well, is what voices have been in the room to decide the direction that we're taking today. And with the conversation about the climate injustice issues, global north and global south, there's a realization that the only people that have been in the room have been St. Gobain that wants to sell you their glass and wholesome that wants to sell you their cement. It has been the global north people with uh, very, very tied to a very specific solution. And that, that's not okay anymore. That, that <coughs> more voices need to be in the room. And it's beginning to happen. And, and I'll just give you one example of it. At COP28, there's an agreement that we're gonna bring the global ministers of culture together and they are going to actually create what's called a joint work, a joint, a joint decision agreement on, on how do we take uh, multiple cultural perspectives into account in the climate conversation. The first time in, this was COP28, okay, first time in 28 years that, that the UN has said, we need to make an overt effort to increase the voices in the room. Carl, mm -hmm. will we see some more some more information? Is that are we going to see some videos coming? Um, the videos are, are are going to be posted. Okay. As additional reading. Okay. Perfect. Just just because okay. the so time. Okay. Let's go into the discussion. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, uh, I would like to to, to return uh, on the questions there uh, on our role into this discussion. Um, uh, there are many voices. Uh, it's very confusing. Uh, uh, we uh, form part of a group of people who um, advocate the, the need to uh, return to a more uh, equitable, more sustainable uh, way of life, way to build and everything. And, uh, the fact is that all this uh, remains, still remains very isolated, uh, not impactful. Uh, what you were mentioning about the uh, culture and the Ministry of Culture reflects one point that is substantial in this discussion, that all the efforts for sustainability have been invested in developing new technologies which develop new problems instead of solving. While we are uh, advocating the fact that the cultural dimension is exactly what we call we are trying to do in bridging preservation with sustainability, because bridging preservation with sustainability uh, uh, means exactly to look back in a moment where everyone is saying, if we want solutions, we have to look forward and find new things. We say no, uh, because uh, there is uh, a wealth of knowledge that is there has been used for centuries, of course, 
we have changed our style of life, we have our uh, standards of life, we have improved our life, our health, everything. <clears throat> but at the same time, we have abandoned all that. So um, the point here is to understand the, uh, the role of research. Because uh, we are universities connecting uh, to the professional world, and uh, the, as the dean was saying, research becomes uh, a must for all of us to uh, address uh, our pedagogical goals, but at the same time also have our function which is social. So uh, here the point of research becomes the, the key in everything. Um, Europe, uh, with the Green Deal, is, has put billions of euro uh, to make the green transition. But when you go and look into detail into that, you see that all this is just, looks like just a way to create business in Europe and generate new potentials for Europe to be, uh, not to stay apart from China, from the United States, and generate a business. What is going on with the green transition is a shame. It's a complete shame in the way we uh, incentives have been given in Italy to uh, make more per, uh, uh, performing the, the, uh, building existing buildings. As people who had just installed new uh, uh, windows, they just threw them out to, to, to get incentives and make new buildings. Where, where does this go? And all the, this is, is very alarming. It's very alarming. So, what I, uh, I, I do think that here this idea of looking back uh, in a, in a, with a vision is fundamental, but what we, uh, is at the core of our discussions here is which research and in which direction and how to make it impactful. This is our main goal at this very, main, I mean, is the must in this moment for all of us. So um, I think that uh, these meetings become particularly meaningful, and the idea was that, is to understand which research and how to do that, and how to connect. One thing that I find extremely important for you being here is that you are extremely connected to, uh, to a dimension of people who think like us and which we are not connected to yet. Yeah. And this would be the chance for us to connect. Okay. We need to pass from a global to a regional uh, scale, as we have been saying. That means that the wind towers in Iran, you don't take that and you expand in all the, the world, because this is how it has developed in that place, because the winds go in a direction, the, uh, the height of the cities are that, and this works there, but you don't take it that and you place it in Africa, wow! is the miracle, it's not global, it's local. And in our work of preservation, we study to understand how people through hundreds of years have developed the best way to approach comfort and, uh, and adapt to the natural environment. So we need to do that. I think here we need to find in these five meetings uh, directions for research, very clear. And in these five meetings, we need to connect to these people. We not need to make international conferences where we gather for 10 days and discuss. We don't need that. We need to be practical. At least this is my perception. Uh, Phil, you have raised your hand. Yeah. Um, John, I'll come to you. Um, Carl, first of all, thank you for this presentation and for uh, really encouraging us to take um, all, these, all these big picture views and and, and for you know, arguing about how, how all these things are, are related. Uh, so um, I just I want to identify, uh, I guess, a question and then uh, two or three issues uh, to, to throw on the table that I think uh, is something to, to uh, you know, for, for sort of deeper consideration of the general topics um, that you've given us. So the, the first question, uh, I'm, I'm, again, I'm struck uh, by a number of statistics, but one of them was that by the end of the century, the world will be 90% urban. What does that mean, urban? Um, and you don't have to answer that, but I'm just curious yeah. as to what, what is meant by the people who 
say it? Does it mean yeah. is it the population? It, it, is it it's area? pretty specifically okay. defined. Yeah. Okay, so we can, we can come back to that. But so I, I'm just trying to identify issues. So um, the second one has to do with um, the issue of, of global demographics and their economic implications. Um, because the the Western world, the modern uh, and, and its and its imports, right? The the, the north, you know, the the global north. Uh, populations have been shrinking. Uh, birth, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, not populations, but uh, fertility rates have been shrinking. And if we just use the U.S. as an example, uh, they've been fr they've been shrinking for three generations and to below what demographers identify as a 2.1. Uh, uh, births per woman as a, as a population replacement. Um, and so that's just, uh, that's, what's, that's what's needed globally in order to maintain a population. So, but what's happening in the advanced industrial world is that you, you've got uh, all over Western Europe, Eastern Europe, uh, Korea, Japan, China, well below, you know, one and a half, right? So what that's doing is it's creating a society in which uh, there are a lot of old people at the top and fewer young people at the bottom. And, in, and until you get up to 2.1, that's what it stays at, which means there's a whole lot of social service implications and things that, that fall by the wayside. But, but it also has to do, I think, with economic initiative. You have a lot fewer young people who are being entrepreneurs, right, who are taking risks. You have a lot more old people who are requiring care from the work of young people. And that's not changing until, until the population changes. So, uh, so I don't know, you know, I don't know if anyone's thinking about that in, in this context. Um, the third so, thing, so let me just okay. interject to say, absolutely. Uh, actually, the Pew Center for Research is probably a really one okay. really good source of that. I mean, their, their version is, we've gone from this right. to that. Yeah, you know the, 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 the age pyramid is not a pyramid anymore, it's a rectangle. Yeah. There's so, as many 80-year-olds as there are 8-year-olds. Right. right. So the, the third thing has to do with the notion of, of affordable housing for all, and again, the implications of, of uh, the, the economic and political implications of that. I mean, one can imagine that in a socialist society, in, in a market economy, um, there's the difficulty of uh, housing as an investment. Right, because I think that the premise of, of affordable housing for all is the notion of, of, of justice, is the notion of shelter, that human beings you know, deserve shelter. Um, but that seems to me to be in, uh, you know, in what I would say, a conflict with the idea of housing as an investment, because uh, you know, homeowners want their investment to grow, right? And so that creates uh, a tension, uh, I'll, I'll understate it, creates a tension with respect to solving the problem of affordable housing. And then, the, and then the, the fourth thing and the last thing is really just uh, to follow up uh, a little bit on what Paul was saying, which is the issue of, of, of ends and means, right? Uh, because it seems to me that the, the ends that's been, that have been outlined by the UN and, and are, are sort of thought of in a global perspective. And of course, uh, to the extent that climate, climate change is a driver, climate change affects everybody. But uh, it still begs the question about what the what the appropriate means are for achieving those ends and of articulating some kind of relationship between regional conditions, climate conditions, material conditions, cultural traditions, and how those, which, which interestingly, independently, uh, historically created built environments that are durable and sustainable, uh, but that, that then in the modern world, they're not. And so, so it suggests that there may be, that one of the problems may be that that we have the kind of global architectural culture that we have because we have the kind of global culture that we have. Uh, and so it's a question of how this relationship between this big perspective, this holistic environmental perspective, which is absolutely necessary, with sort of getting fine grain down into the local circumstances of climate and culture and things like that. Uh, re really terrific points. Uh, that that uh, On the last, I would just say that one of the things that I find interesting about the whole climate driver is that, in the end, the, this you know international framework, uh, national commitments, uh, literally local implementation. I mean, it literally, and the kind of in the intermediate level is almost gone, you know. But there are some states that are doing things and so on. But that that. The, 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 the action at each one of those levels is absolutely critical, and there's no way to do it 
just at one level or the other. They really are connected. Right. Do you think there's more than three? I guess that's the that, yeah. that would be the kind of yeah. question. That John, yeah, we have to go to the class. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Where are we on time? Yeah. Oh, it's about that Thank time. So are, there, are there any more comments? Just briefly. Yeah, there are, there are a few more. So. Yeah. So go ahead. I think I think we can oh, right, continue. Just give yourselves five minutes and we'll yeah. just over. Yeah. The greatest frustration in this conversation for me is um, our, the, our spheres of influence. Where who will listen to us? You know who will listen to the expertise you bring to the table? And what frustrates me uh, is I have a very sort of hyper local focus on this kind of work, and I work for a university who does not listen to our advice. Okay, we're occupying a building that's LEED Silver certified, that is cavity wall construction. Even though we explicitly asked for bearing masonry construction when we solicited work from John Simpson, the university elected not to follow that construction tonight, went with what they knew, with what they trusted. We got a LEED Silver certified building that is sealed up tight with windows that don't operate, that relies entirely on mechanical systems, that leaks. Right now it's leaking again because it's not properly detailed that satisfies these paper criteria for silver certification and, and sustainability and checks all the boxes that it took, they won't listen to the advice of the people that are actually occupying it. Right? We work for an institution that values um, sustainability, that values energy reduction and carbon emission reduction and invited carbon reduction, but they don't listen to the people who are in this building that actually have solutions for these problems. Um, Richard and I sat on a committee where our advice was disregarded. Where we asked them why they lead so why they produce why they pursue lead certification and didn't give a meaningful answer. We asked them why they only pursue certification for new buildings and not for renovations, and we got a very honest answer. And the honest answer was the existing buildings outperform the new buildings. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they outperform the new buildings because they're not air conditioned. They said, because we can't compare them apples to apples, yeah. because we can't compare a non-air-conditioned building to an air-conditioned building, we don't compare them. They don't meter their existing buildings. They don't monitor the energy consumption in the existing buildings in any meaningful way, because they're not obliged to do so, number one, mm -hmm. uh, and because they know what the result is. They know that if they monitor their old buildings on campus, they won't work as well as this building here. So our own institution, the place where we're sitting right now, won't listen to the good advice that we've been trying to give them. John, so that's very, the first we have to go very fast. I'll single answer, single uh, sentence answer this question. I think as architects, we need to become advocates. The problem is that we are willing to, uh, to take the world as it is. We are willing to not take this as it and argue, but we're not willing to take the next five years of our lives to write a white paper or a book that actually explains why the universe is full of it when it comes to the question of how it's operating. And I think that's where research comes in. Because it's not the problem of the university, it's the problem of the entire world. You know, the greenwashing going on around us yeah. is extreme. And I think that, that, you know, you and Richard, your next book should be about how to actually address the question of the, 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 uh, the, the social and energy performance of a campus. I think that would be completely extraordinary. I'm concerned that the people who are involved even from within the schools on these questions are data-driven and not value-driven, which is another whole issue about what happens with research. We have to address that also from a, from an advocate's point of view. I'm sorry for time yeah, it's wasted. Well, I'll keep this very brief. Um, but my concern is, is about um, both globally and locally how much we're willing to opt out of an economic system that values growth versus one that values health and happiness. Um, I think the, globally our entire world is out of integrity because we're operating with an invisible system that's something that we've accepted as truth and as, as a result of we're all born into it generation to generation for thousands of years right? and where um, we are equating bankruptcy to death. And so as professionals running businesses or even um, academics in an institution like this is very financially driven, we are compelled to stay on the wheel of business as usual. Um, and I, I don't know what the answer is yet, but how can we collectively, at least at this scale, all of us in the room, take a pause, reevaluate, create a different train that we can jump off of this one and onto that one, it's not going to work for everybody all at the same time, but we need an alternative model, um, and it's going to require discomfort 
Um, we've been building a world that's made for human comfort, but as most of us know, human comfort is not always the healthiest thing and doesn't always bring us the growth that we need as a society. Okay, can, uh, can, can, we have, can we have one more? Because the people yeah, are doing yeah. so good. So I was just going to follow up with what Phil said and a little, a little bit what Brian said, is that if 90% of the world is going to be urban you know, by the end of the century. And thinking of that economic model, yeah. the economic model that people are going to push for is high-rise buildings. When you have places like housing or housing and urban development that's saying, we're not building in flood zones anymore, we're done. We're not investing any more money in flood zones. And you have all of these cities that are being impacted by climate change and, and more nuisance flooding or worse, um, their argument is going to be to house all these people, we're going to go with the high-rise structure because we have no other choice. Um, so how do we address that? Do we build new cities and that means eating up more land and eating up more resources? Or do we figure out a way, like there's money out there right now for converting office buildings, in, uh, unused office buildings into housing. Nobody is exploring that. They can't give that money away. And um, no, uh, so these are these are bigger issues that, that it, a lot of times they're, they're in conflict with each other because what do we do to address this problem when simple fact is we can't continue to expand the cities outward, can't continue to expand the urban scale outward when the urban scale is running headlong into the issues of, of climate change. Well, I want to tie the these three comments back together, kind of go back and to And if you, if you would also end it, because yeah. I was going to say <laughs> and, and just, just say that underneath each one of those things that creates that frustration, if, if you look at the color of law as an example, mm -hmm. there's something fundamentally wrong that was the assumption on which that was based. Mm -hmm. There's sand under those foundations. And Rothstein's book, it got, got the sort of zoning level discussion to really change. And, and I think if, if, we, if we start by showing that under the, the foundation of all these things, like let's just build taller buildings, that's the solution, that it's actually built in sand, uh, I think that's, that's an important place where a lot of these things start. Carl, so, do you want to give us just a, a, a conclusion today, summary, and then what's next and you know, what do we do in between? Absolutely. So thank you so much for coming. This is uh, exactly the type of thing I hope that would be the beginning of a conversation. We're going to have four more sessions. They're roughly at, at three, week, three work week intervals. Um, you've got the schedule available for that. Um, we will also post the three uh, rec pre-recorded presentations that will just sort of uh, illuminate on each one of these topics a little bit more. Um, please feel free to uh, brainstorm this in any way that you want to. Send me your your thoughts, bullet point it. I don't care. It, 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 I don't care about the format. Just if you have any follow up thoughts, please let me know. We do want to come out of this. Actually, Paulo said it exactly right. We want to come out with this with an idea about direction that really informs our instruction, our research, our relationships with others, and so on. We want this to, to, to help us get out of uh, the conundrum of uh, knowing that we have important things to share and nobody wants to listen. Um, so that's the very, that's the very uh, goal of these maybe, sessions. Maybe one of the goals should be that architecture becomes a word in these two interlocking research circles yeah. that all of a sudden will begin to exist as a discipline, maybe, yeah. in collaboration with others. Thank you. So, so again, thank you again for thank you.